Well, you look at the thumbnail, you read the title, time to do what every man child likes to do. Figuring out how strong a fictional character is. Final Fantasy XIV is not the kind of game where the community discusses about how strong the characters are in this game. But after more than 10 years of journey, countless of adventures and stories, how strong is in lore warrior of light truly is. Disclaimer, as I said, I don't see this topic being tossed around a lot. I did a lot of research for this going through the power scaling wiki and looking up bits and pieces of lore that could maybe give a hint on this topic. Since the game has been going on for over 10 years, of course I would miss a lot of stuff because there are countless sources, not only in-game but in merchandise and official websites that I'm not aware of. So if I miss something, please do tell me in the comments because I'm really interested to know extra information about these kind of stuff. If I miss a lot of things, I might even make a second part to this video. I'm also not gonna cover the raid series for now because it would make things so much more complicated. Like scaling Alexander, Omega, and even the Eden raid series is gonna give me a headache. Our journey starts in ARR. Even though ARR wasn't the most exciting expansion lore-wise, we get some pretty good feats for our Warrior of Light even in the early stages of their adventure. For starters, since Warrior of Light is a chosen Warrior of Hydaelyn, they have Echo. And oh boy, where do I start? Echo grants the main character dozens of advantages. One of them is precognition. Do you know that the markers above your head or the puddle below you that you can see and dodge out of has a connection to the story and its canon? Even people with fake Echo like Fordola, after Fordola gained the artificial Echo, she was able to dodge Alice's and Lisa's attack without any trouble, which she couldn't do before. She even stated, I know what you can do. I've already seen it. Echo also grants you immunity to the tempering. To put it really simply, it's basically a mind control that primals have. Tempering is not a one and done effect. It requires some time to fully take over an individual, but the first contact with the tempering causes the mind of the individual to be enslaved by the primals. There are plenty of people that can beat primals, but we're specifically tasked with defeating primals because we have immunity to the tempering. Our first primal fight was Ifrit. Ifrit has some impressive showing even in the trailer. Quotes taken from the official Final Fantasy XIV website. His breath ignites the very air, his claws melt the strongest steel, and his twisted horns scorch the heavens. Those who would face him must be prepared to withstand the fires of hell. If we assume that the statement isn't just for gassing Ifrit up, if it's true that his claws melt the strongest steel, then his claws has to be hotter than the melting point of things such as iron alloys and steels, which could vary between 2200 to 2500 Fahrenheit, or 1200 to 1370 Celsius. Ifrit trapped us in a fire circle, and that's a feat in itself. The color of the fire honestly looks like it's red. The reason why this is important is because fire changes color based on its temperature. That is the coolest one that it's orange. But either way, aside from burning, there's a lot of things that can happen when you're around intense heat like that. Carbon monoxide poisoning, heat stroke, and a lot more. Despite all of that, we were just tanking Ifrit's auto attacks and then we just kinda beat the sh out of it. Our next victim is Titan. There was a statement that Titan was causing a mountain-shaking tremor felt by every man in the northern half of Philbrand. If you don't know, Lanosia is a part of Philbrand. All of Lanosia. So this statement is pretty insane from a power scaling perspective. It's also consistent in game too, where Titan could just jump and destroy parts of the arena. And even with Titan, that could cause literal earthquakes. We still beat the living out of Titan. We also have Garuda in our list, she could create storms that looks like it could wipe entire cities. We don't have the calculations for this feat, so we just have to eyeball it. But I think I proved my point that the Warrior of Light even in ARR is a beast already compared to your average anime shounen characters. But none of these foes are even close in terms of power compared to the next boss that we're gonna be fighting. The Ultima weapon is a weapon created by the Elegant Empire. It is an anti-primal killing machine, capable of killing Ifrit, Titan, and Garuda at the same time. We were able to fight it and eventually Ultima weapon casted a spell called Ultima. It was a spell stored inside the Black Aura site or we know it better as the Heart of Sabik that was inside the Ultima weapon. The Heart of Sabik is no joke because it predates the Sundering. And the Ultima spell? Well, I think it's easier to just show you all. 
Well, yeah, we were amped by Hydlin, but I will argue that at this point Hydlin's blessing is taken into account when we're talking about what the Warrior of Flight can do. Moving on to Heaven's Ward, some of the notable feats that we did was beat Nidhogg with the help of Raze's eyes, but a really interesting part I wanted to touch on in this expansion is how we beat King Thornton. Thornton was able to basically one-shot La Habria, even though La Habria was weakened, one-shotting an Asian, moreover it's La Habria, one of the stronger Asians that didn't get his soul split, it's no small feat. Thornton uses the right eye of Nidhogg that he kept and he basically became a primal. And after that, he absorbed La Habria's Aether. I do not have concrete proof that King Thornton became stronger after absorbing La Habria, but if you do think that's the case then, he transformed into a primal and he's at least as strong as one Nidhogg's eye. That alone wouldn't be that impressive, but he was also accompanied by his knights. The squad of knights that we faced is called Heaven's Ward. It is heavily implied that their transformed forms are also primals. While we don't have a definitive answer on how strong they are, we see one of the knights actually kill Hasherfan. And I don't think Hasherfan is a slouch as well. He's a knight, and we can use his bot for dungeons. I think it's reasonable for him to be as strong as your average knight, maybe a bit stronger. Or if you want to highball him, maybe he's a bit weaker than your average scions. And despite all of that, we kinda just beat all of them? Another thing in this game is that sometimes it is implied that we won against something but we're not alone like in the Crystal Towers questline. It was stated that we should gather our comrades before going in but also sometimes we fight alone. Thornton of course is an 8-man raid gameplay wise, but in lore, it wasn't actually specified whether we fight him and his knights alone or not. If you believe that we fought Thorin with 7 other people then sure, it would be still impressive either way. But in the cutscene, we can see that the Warrior of Flight is just standing there, alone. And then next up is Stormblood. I think Stormblood is the first expansion where the trailer really shows off what the Warrior of Flight is capable of doing after going through ARR and Heaven's Ward. And so our first encounter with Xenos, we got absolutely on. And remember, at this point in time, the Warrior of Light could slice through bullets, and he still lost. But by the end of Stormblood, we were able to beat Xenos, that infused with Shinryu, that possesses a Nidhogg eye. What? This shit got me tripping. It was kinda stated that the Warrior of Light and his allies were able to defeat Shinryu, meaning we got some help, but it's still really insane if you think about it. Because at this point we covered so many characters, I want to introduce everyone to what I like to call the stairs. So at the very bottom, we have your average male storm soldier. And then on top of them, we have your average start of the series scion. I don't think people will disagree if I say that the scion even in the very start of the story are stronger than your average Joe NPC. And then skipping pretty far, we have the icons in ARR. You could argue which one of them is stronger, but I think they're pretty relative. After that, it gets really messy and cluttered. I decided to put Nidhogg and Frazier. I thought long and hard about this, leading me into trying to quantify how much of a boost one dragon eye is. Me and my friend thought of trying to theorize will Warrior of Light at the end of Heaven's Ward with the help of one Frazier's eye be stronger than the Warrior of Light that has Hydlin's Blessing? It's just so strange. Because I'm trying to figure out whether I want to put Ultima weapon here, or Nidhogg and Raze here. It's also really complicated because Ultima weapon of course has the higher attack potency, but it just doesn't mean that Ultima weapon can just beat up Nidhogg. Because Nidhogg is faster, he can fly, and Ultima takes ages to charge. So it's like, Nidhogg can just fly away? I guess what I'm trying to say is, I just feel more comfortable putting Nidhogg here because Ultima Weapon is probably a bigger threat than Nidhogg overall. Next up on the list is Thornton and his 12 knights. My reasoning is he doesn't seem to be afraid of neither Nidhogg or Freeze, and the story heavily implied that he's not really afraid of any Ashians or dragons for that matter. He's pretty confident in his ability to beat them. Ultima Weapon comes up next. Again, it's really up just to interpretation, but Estinian found another Ultima Weapon replica. Even though it almost definitely is weaker and haven't absorbed any Primal's power, Estinian with the help of one Nidhogg's eye can beat it without much trouble. In terms of attack potency, Ultima probably has one of the highest AP. Ultima literally deleted Praetorium of the map. And on top of Ultima Weapon, we have Xenos. Yes, 
You see how long the staircase is already? At the start of Stormblood, our fight with Xenos wasn't even close. But as I mentioned before, in the end of Stormblood, we and our allies were able to beat up Xenos that fused with Shinryu, which is pretty f***ing crazy. I'm going to skip some parts of the stairs that I think isn't interesting and move on to the main antagonist that we beat along the way. After getting Isekai'd, our first opponent was Ranjit. I don't know, it doesn't make any fucking sense how Ranjit was able to fend us off. But skipping a few steps, we can see Venat. Putting Venat here is probably controversial, but it was stated that Venat is stronger than your average ancients. And we actually fought Venat in a duel. Remind you, the Venat here is an ancient, but the battle seemingly ended in a stalemate. So they have to be at least relative in strength. Unless you want to argue that Venat is really holding back, but she literally said, let neither side hold back, so... The next four is pretty self-explanatory. Ellie Dibus with a Dynamis Amp was able to teleport Warrior of Light in a pocket dimension, where we would've probably died if we didn't get help from a certain someone. And on top of that, he was able to use LB with the power of Dynamis. Emmet probably is the strongest Asian. If it weren't for plot armor, Artbert rejoining with our soul, and us not having the Light Warden's light, we would've been cooked, man. Zodiac is a primal that has the Aether of half of the Ancients that got sacrificed to summon him. His Aether was strong enough to even prevent the coming of Dynamis from the Song of Oblivion. And then Hydaelyn beats Zodiac and seals him. Not only that, she still has the power to do some crazy shit like sealing Ultima the High Seraph. And after all of that, she's still strong enough to shield us from the Ultima spell and a lot more that I cannot mention in one video. And now, this is where End of Series Warrior of Light starts to cap out in my opinion. End of Series Warrior of Light with Azem Crystal is probably stronger than Venat and Elidibus. He also probably beats non-prime Hydaelyn. Yeah, he beat her with the Scions, but he can use the Azem Crystal to basically replicate the same thing. But with Hades? I'm not sure. Warrior of Light of course got stronger throughout Endwalker, but one of the biggest upgrades he got to his arsenal was the Azem Crystal. But even with that, I'm not so sure, because we still had to use White Aura Sight, which is the most OP sh** ever, to give us an opening and actually deal the finishing blow. And in my opinion, even with the feats that he did against Ensinger that I'm gonna get to in a bit, my gut feeling tells me it's not enough to convince me that the Warrior of Light could win against Hades one on one, even with the Azim Crystal. And okay, now for the strongest character in the stairs. Meteon is a creature made out of pure dynamis. After she concluded that she sees no reason why life should continue, she travels to the edge of the universe and starts singing the Song of Oblivion. This song is strong enough to basically change the shape of your soul, turning people with negative emotions into these disgusting things. Not as disgusting as your mom. And mind you, the area of effect of the song is universal. She has a lot of random abilities like throwing planetoids, Turning back time, suffocating people. The only reason why we win was because the Scion shielded us from that super big bang final attack through the power of Dynamis. If not, even with the power of Azem Crystal and Xenos helping us, we would have probably been dead. So, how strong is the Warrior of Light? If you're new or old to power scaling, you need to bear with me here because I need to explain some nerdy stuff, but at the same time, I'm also new to this, so yeah. At the bare minimum, you can say that he is tier 7 the power scaling, which is town level. Town level characters, just like as its name implied, have the capability to destroy an entire town. I personally think this is an unreasonable low ball, however. This scaling is taken from primals that could cause natural disasters and 4 3 who can rip a huge mountain from the ground and levitate it in the air. A more reasonable scaling for the Warrior of Light is tier 5, which is planet level. Planets here characters are characters that are capable of destroying planets, duh. Being able to defeat Hydaelyn, that was able to split the physical universe into 13 reflections or beating Ensinger that was able to throw mini planetoids at you, puts the Warrior of Light comfortably in this spot or even a tier above. A rather controversial take however I've been encountering is the Warrior of Light being tier 2. Tier 2 being multiversal level. Which basically means that these characters are capable of affecting spaces much bigger than our universe, even larger than the entire past, present, and future of all kinds of space and time. This scaling is taken from some statements like the Warrior of Light capable of keeping up with Gilgamesh that can travel between universes. 
and he can also survive attacks that manipulate space or beat a replica of X-Death. The original X-Death was stated that he was about to erase all universe from existence, or even statements about Zurvan that controls the endless expanse of infinity. Although these statements are controversial because there's no telling without a shadow of a doubt that any of these are true or not. Gilgamesh is proven to be able to travel across the Final Fantasy dimension but there's no proofing that this Gilgamesh is the one that participated in the Dissidia conflict. We fought Neo X Death, yes, but it's only his replica that Omega made. And I've seen some people argue that the Zurvan statement is hyperbole. I know I said I wasn't gonna include the raid series in this video, but I just had to include the galaxy attack in E1. If this was an actual galaxy and it's not an AI simulation alien cloning we live in a simulation kind of thing, this scene is crazy. I guess I owe you an apology, I wasn't really familiar with your game. So depending on your interpretation, he can either be a tier 7 character, tier 5 or planetary, or a literal god character that exists beyond our understanding. For me personally though, I think he's around high 5 or low 4, low 4 being a character that can destroy stars. Giving him 7 is being very disingenuous, and while you could give him a 3 or a 2, the statements that indicate the warrior of light being on that level is just not concrete. So next time you're about to punt a Lalafell, just remember that they are capable of killing literal gods and they could bite off your toes if they wanted to.